on the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, Katie Weaver reports on Vietnam's plans to restart rare earth mining. John Russell has a story about ancient stone designs discovered under the Amazon River. Brian Lynn has this week's science report on seismic activity on Mars. Later, Andrew Smith and Joe Robbins present the lesson of the day. But first... Vietnam plans to restart its biggest rare earths mine next year. The project could greatly increase the supply of the elements to compete with China. The rare earth minerals help power advanced technologies. The United States Geological Survey, USGS, says rare earths are a set of 17 metallic elements that are necessary in the production of high-tech products from mobile phones and electric vehicles to advanced weapons. China only has about one-third of the world's rare earth reserves, but a 2022 study from Marsh McLennan says that the country now controls more than 60% of rare earth mining and 85% of processing capacity worldwide. The USGS estimates that Vietnam has the world's second largest rare earth reserves after China. They have remained largely unmined. Last September, U.S. President Joe Biden signed an agreement during his Vietnam visit to help the country with getting investors to open mining operations. The agreement is a step toward helping the Southeast Asian country build up a rare earths supply chain. The deal's terms include developing the country's ability to turn raw elements into metals used in magnets for electric vehicles, smartphones, and wind turbines. As a first step, Vietnam's government plans to auction several areas of its Dung Pao mine to investors before the end of the year. Tessa Kutcher is an executive at Australia's Blackstone Minerals, a company that plans to bid on the project. Kutcher told Reuters news agency that Blackstone's investment would be worth around $100 million if it wins. She added that the company was talking to electric car makers, including Vinfast and Rivian, about possible supply contracts. The Dong Pao mine has been inactive for at least seven years. Two Japanese companies, Toyota Sucho and Sojits, left mining projects at Dung Pao after China greatly increased the rare earth supply to bring the prices down. Refining rare earths is complex and China controls many processing technologies. Still, Hanoi University of Mining and Geology says that rare earths at Dong Pao are relatively easy to mine and are mostly concentrated in bastnasite ores. These rare earth ores will then be ground into powder and processed into rare earth oxide, REO. Luang Tun is the chairman of Vietnam Rare Earth, 
VTRE. The company is Vietnam's main refiner and Blackstone's partner in the project. He expected Dong Pao to produce about 30,000 metric tons of rare earth oxide equivalent a year. That amount would put Dong Pao's output a little below that of California's Mountain Pass, one of the world's largest mines, which produced 43,000 metric tons of the element in 2022. In July, Vietnam's government said it planned to develop additional mines to produce up to 60,000 tons of REO equivalent a year by 2030. China set its own target of 210,000 tons last year. Once separated, oxides are turned into metals for use in magnets and other industrial products. China is the world's leader of the metallization process, producing 90% of rare earth metals, the U.S. Department of Energy says. But VTRE is working on a project to build a metallization factory with South Korea's Sotopia. Dudley Kingsnorth, is a professor at the Western Australia School of Mines at Curtin University. He said Vietnam had some way to go to reach its rare earth goals. Still, he said, Vietnam has the resources, the mining and processing expertise to provide alternatives to China. I'm Katie Weaver. Human faces cut into stone up to 2,000 years ago have again been found on a rocky area along the Amazon River in northern Brazil. The stone carvings appeared as a result of a big drop in water levels because of dry weather in parts of northern Brazil. People had reported some of the rock carvings before, during periods when water levels were low. But now a greater number have been identified. That will help researchers establish the history of the carvings, researcher Jaime de Santana Oliveira said recently. One area shows smooth markings in the rock, thought to be where indigenous people once sharpened their weapons, such as arrows and spears, before European settlers arrived. The engravings are prehistoric or pre-colonial. We cannot date them exactly, but based on evidence of human occupation of the area, we believe they are about 1,000 to 2,000 years old, Oliveira said. The rocky area is on the north shore of the Amazon, near the place where the Rio Negro River joins the Amazon. Oliveira said the carvings were first seen in 2010, but this year's drought has been more severe than earlier dry periods. The Rio Negro's levels dropped 15 meters since July, uncovering large areas of rocks and sand where there had been no beaches. This time we found not just more carvings, but the sculpture of a human face cut into the rock, said Oliveira, who works for the Brazilian government's National Historic and Artistic Heritage Institute. The organization oversees the care of historic places in Brazil. I'm John Russell.
scientists now believe the largest quake ever recorded on Mars was the result of seismic activity, not a strike by a space object. Instruments attached to the InSight lander identified the quake in 2021. The InSight lander is a Mars explorer operated by the American Space Agency, NASA. On Earth, seismic activity causes earthquakes. Scientists often call seismic activity on Mars, Mars quakes. NASA estimated the largest Mars quake had a strength of 4.7. While this level of quake would not be considered major on Earth, it is very powerful on Mars. Scientists say a Mars quake happens when Martian soil is subjected to a buildup of pressure so great that it causes rock structures to break. So far, the InSight lander has identified or detected more than 1,300 Mars quakes. The explorer uses a device called a seismometer to detect the ground movements. The seismometer was designed to be extremely sensitive for the Martian environment. It aims to differentiate between seismic signals coming from inside Mars and activity coming from above the surface, such as wind or meteorite strikes. Researchers look at other things to confirm whether a Mars quake was caused by seismic activity below the surface or by an outside force hitting the planet. In the case of the strongest Mars quake ever recorded, an international team of scientists looked for evidence of a crater that would have been created by a large meteorite hit. The team was led by researchers from Britain's University of Oxford. But scientists working for space agencies in Europe, China, India, and the United Arab Emirates also took part. China has an explorer on Mars, and the other agencies all have spacecraft orbiting the planet. A recently released study describes the findings in geophysical research letters. The research team estimated that a 4.7-level Mars quake would have created a crater at least 300 meters in diameter. Two other large Mars quakes left craters of about 150 meters. So the researchers searched satellite data collected by InSight as well as the other space agencies. Each agency examined data from their satellites for evidence of a large crater, as well as other signs that a meteorite might have struck before the largest Mars quake. Another sign team members noted could have been a dust cloud appearing in the hours after the quake. But after several months of searching, the researchers said no new larger crater was found. They said their examinations ruled out a meteorite strike as the cause of the 4.7 Mars quake. The researchers decided instead that the largest Mars quake must have been caused by the release of powerful tectonic forces at work deeper inside the Red Planet. This finding suggests that Mars is much more seismically active than previously thought, the Oxford University team said in a statement. Benjamin Fernando is a professor of physics at Oxford University who led the study. 
He said in a statement that scientists do not believe Mars has ongoing tectonic movements. Rather, Fernando said the team thinks the largest Mars quake was caused by the release of stress within Mars' crust. He added that such stress is likely the result of billions of years of development on Mars, including the cooling and shrinking of different parts of the planet at different speeds. We still do not fully understand why some parts of the planet seem to have higher stresses than others, but results like these help us to investigate further, Fernando said. Constantinos Charalambus is a planetary scientist at Imperial College London who helped lead the research. He spoke to Reuters news agency about the finding. He said it represents a significant step forward in our understanding of Martian seismic activity and takes us one step closer to better unraveling the planet's tectonic processes. Fernando added, One day this information may help us to understand where it would be safe for humans to live on Mars and where you might want to avoid. I'm Brian Lynn. Brian Lynn joins me now to talk more about his technology report. Thanks for being here, Brian. Of course, Dan. Thanks for having me. This week's report was about a study that examined the cause of the largest quake ever reported on Mars. Why were the researchers so interested in finding out the exact cause of this so-called Mars quake? So this group of scientists has been studying Mars quakes for quite some time, and in the past, they've concluded most seismic activity on Mars was caused by meteorite strikes. But this time, the team could not link the large Mars quake to a meteorite. This is because they could not find a large enough crater that would have been created. So they wanted to investigate further to see what forces beneath the surface might have caused this quake. What are scientists saying they can learn from their latest finding? The main thing they have said is they hope to learn more about different seismic activity currently happening on Mars and how this compares with what we experience here on Earth. And since NASA has equipment on Mars to measure Mars quakes, both big and small, they say this data can be used in future studies to search for more evidence below the surface and could even be used one day to predict seismic events on Mars. Then we'll have to look out for more Mars quakes in the future. Thanks for being here, Brian. You're welcome, Dan. Thank you. My name is Anna Mateo. My name is Jill Robbins. And I'm Andrew Smith. You're listening to the Lesson of the Day on the Learning English Podcast. Welcome to the part of the show where we help you do more with our series, Let's Learn English. The series shows Anna Mateo in her work and life in Washington, D.C. Butterflies in your stomach. Sweat on the palms of your hands. What do these make you think of? Well, butterflies are not something you want to eat. And sweaty palms? Most people don't want that either. I know what they make me think of, but what do they have to do with Anna? 
Well, our listeners may remember that in Lesson 21 of Let's Learn English, Anna tells her friend Marcia that she has to take a test to get her driver's license. Sorry, I can't come with you. I have to get my driver's license. Will you be busy all day? I don't know. First, I have to take a test on the computer. Then I have to take a test in the car. And now, in Lesson 28, we get to watch Anna take that test. Anna, did you get your driver's license? I did, but it was not easy. Why? What happened? Well, you know, I can drive farm equipment really well, but I was really nervous driving in Washington, D.C. traffic. Did you pass the test the first time? Well, no, but I did pass the second time. What happened during the first test? It started fine. Okay. Anna, is your seatbelt buckled? Yes, sir. Great. Please start the car. Okay, Anna, start the car. I started the car. Good job, Anna. Why are you talking to yourself? I am a little nervous. When I'm nervous, I talk to myself. I'm sure our listeners can understand the feeling of being nervous. When Anna feels nervous, she talks to herself. But some people react in other ways when they are nervous. They might get those butterflies in the stomach. For our listeners, maybe it's now clear what we mean when we say butterflies in the stomach. It's just an expression to describe the feeling of being nervous. Some people do feel it in their stomach. But there are lots of other things that can happen in your body when you are nervous. Like you might find it hard to sit still, so you keep moving your hands or some other part of your body. And when people feel really nervous, they might notice their heart starting to beat faster and stronger. That's because the body releases a hormone called adrenaline when we're nervous. That excitement of the nerves is also called the fight-or-flight response. And flight, in this case, does not mean flying on an airplane. Flight is a noun that means running away from danger. So, Jill, how about you? What's it like for you when you feel nervous? <laughs> when I'm nervous about something, I start cleaning. <laughs> You know, like wiping the dust off my table or picking up clutter or running the vacuum on the carpet. It's like if I can get my house in order, my life will be in order, too. How about you? <laughs> I have to say that's pretty funny, but it makes sense. Um, for me, sometimes my hands get cold and sometimes I start to sweat a little bit under my arms. And I'm sure our listeners have some other ways that they react. You can write us at learningenglish at voanews.com and let us know what makes you nervous and how your body reacts. I'm Jill Robbins, and you're listening to the lesson of the day on the Learning English Podcast. Andrew, what kind of situations tend to make you nervous? Um... Sometimes, if I have to speak to a large group of people, I can feel some nerves. But because I've been a teacher, speaking to groups doesn't bother me too much. Um, but sometimes when I perform music for other people, I can get nervous. How about you, Jill? I get nervous when I'm going to do a webinar or an online meeting. I try to prepare everything in advance and practice so I know exactly what I'm going to do. And you probably have a very clean desk before you do that. <laughs> you bet. 
Uh, in general, I think people tend to get nervous when they worry that other people might judge them and that they might not perform well. Unfortunately, this can happen when we are trying to speak a foreign language. How do you think learners should deal with this? I think some good advice is to simply keep trying and to know that most people listening to you, they understand that you are trying and they won't think bad things about you. Yeah, most people are nice, at least most of the time. Now, let's go back to Anna's driving test. Her driving instructor is not nervous at the beginning, but during the test, he also probably feels a rush of adrenaline. But in his case, it's because of fear. He's probably having the flight response we mentioned. I think so. Let's listen to Anna's driving test. Why are you talking to yourself? I am a little nervous. When I'm nervous, I talk to myself. You don't need to be nervous. Listen to that engine. Please, stop pushing the gas pedal. Sorry. Okay, when you are ready, turn. Great! Not now, you almost hit that car. You said turn. Look first, there were cars in the street. Please don't yell at me. I'm sorry, I was afraid. You were yelling. Look out for that car, break, break. Why is everyone honking at us? You were driving too slow. Anna, stay on the street. Hands on the wheel, Anna. What's that sound? That, Anna, is the police. Well, it can be difficult to drive in Washington, D.C., especially if you are a new driver. I think both Anna and her instructor were having an adrenaline rush. The expressions an adrenaline rush and a rush of adrenaline can have a positive or negative meaning. In the positive sense, an adrenaline rush is a feeling of excitement, like if you are doing a physical activity, such as downhill skiing, surfing, or riding a bicycle down a steep hill. And the negative sense means an unwanted or uncomfortable response to nerves or fear. It might be adrenaline that made Anna and her driving instructor yell or speak very loudly. Look first. There were cars in the street. Please don't yell at me. I'm sorry. I was afraid. You were yelling. Look out for that car. Brake, brake. I think. Nervousness is an interesting subject because almost everyone can relate to it. We'll have more to say about dealing with nerves in another lesson of the day. But first, we want to remind you of our question for today. What activities make you nervous? And how does your body react? And you can send that to us by email learning english at voanews.com or in the comments on our youtube channel remember you can always learn more on our website learningenglish.voanews.com you can also find us on youtube facebook and instagram thanks for listening to the lesson of the day on the learning english podcast i'm jill robbins and i'm andrew smith and that's our program for today Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak.